All right, for our second talk of the day, we have Marcus Sturgill, who's going to be telling us about geometric approach for 3D interfaces at Strong Coupling. Take it away, Marcus. Yes, thank you very much. Also, I would like to thank uh, the organizers to putting together this very, very nice seminar series. And I think uh, a lot of people, including myself, are very grateful for that. So uh, today we'll talk about work together with Jonathan, um, Ethan, and Thomas, all at Penn with the two guys, these two guys being a PhD student. And, and uh, if you want more details, because unfortunately today I will only be able to um, like start uh, the analysis and like simplified examples, but cannot tell you the full story, uh, I advertise the paper that you can find on the archive on the, this number here. So, so the topic is for 3D interfaces at strong coupling and um, I will, oops, uh, I will start by giving a non-dynamical example, which technically can be found also in the condensed matter literature as the topological insulator, as well as the topological insulator interface. Um, and uh, then I will go to a dynamical example where it's technically just Maxwell theory, and uh, we're interested in the time reversal invariant subspace of the moduli space of the Maxwell, uh, pure Maxwell theory. And we can generalize this from the SL2C of Maxwell theory to uh, a duality group that is only a subgroup of the SL, full SL2Z. And this has a nice interpretation also in terms of a, a six dimensional setup that I will briefly introduce later. And then I, I, I don't have time probably, but I will just give you a hint of how to construct uh, interfaces in different ways in four dimensions, which might uh, lead to more and uh, even more exotic behaviors. And then I will uh, conclude and give a short outlook of what might be interesting from, from there on. So let me start with a topological insulator, which is an idea that appeared around 2005, six in the condensed matter literature. And basically it's a system that uh, has an unbroken global U1 symmetry and unbroken time reversal symmetry. As is usual in condensed matter and all nowadays also in, in um, in high energy theory, whenever you have a global symmetry, you couple it to a background field. So this is a non-dynamical field, and in our case, it's just the abelian U1A, U1A here. And essentially, if you don't have a dynamical field, you cannot write down the dynamical kinetic term, but you can write down a local term, which is given by the theta, uh, the theta topological term here, just uh, the FHF term. But for any theta, this would break um, time reversal invariance, which we do not want. We want to preserve U1 as well as time reversal invariance. And this basically restricts us to just two possible values for theta. The theta. So theta equals to zero is the trivial phase where this term simply is absent. And then we have theta equals to pi, which is the topological insulator phase. Okay, now with these two phases, you can ask the question, what happens if I basically take uh, one phase on the left half space, the other one on the right half space, and then just glue them together. Um, and this will be the topological insulator interface. So basically we have the topological insulator here, then we vary along, uh, then there's a prop jump actually in this case from theta equals to pi to theta equals to zero. Let's say at x3 equals to zero here. And then we can ask ourselves, so what happens on the interface? And in fact, we know what, what kind of term distinguishes between the topological insulator and the trivial phase. It's just this, this uh, uh, theta uh, term here, and it's a total derivative. So we can immediately say what is happening. Well, we have an induced Chern Simons term living at the interface. However, the Chern Simons term is not integer quantized. So integer quantization would be k divided by four pi here, but we have. Uh, K, uh, one divided by eight pi. So we have a half integer level, so to say, and this would break time reversal invariance. So in order to preserve time reversal invariance in the full setup, even in the, in the presence of the interface, one has to add additional stuff at the interface. And uh, one option would be to add a, a single charge 3D Dirac fermion, which is uh, living just on this interface here. And there is other weakly coupled examples that uh, have been discussed by Seibig and Witten recently, uh, three years ago in a paper where they uh, analyzed different topological field theory and gap phases that can also lead to time reversal invariance preserval in this, in this kind of interface setups. Okay, this is the story in the non-dynamical case, but now of course we are interested in dynamics, so let's make the U1 dynamical. So we add the kinetic term here with a gauge coupling G squared, 
And uh, as we're used to, usually we, we basically summarize the theta angle as well as the gauge coupling inside a complexified coupling constant that you, that you see here. So the imaginary part basically defines the gauge coupling and the real part defines the theta angle. Now this pure Maxwell theory has a SL2Z um, duality, uh, which acts on the complexified gauge coupling in terms of this Möbius transformation here. And it also acts on the electric and the magnetic charges, just as, so they're, they're living in the two-dimensional representation here and they're acted on by this SL2Z matrix essentially. Now let's see what time reversal invariance does in this, in this setup. So time reversal invariance, it basically flips all, it gives a minus to all the terms where you have a zero index appear. So here we always have two zeros because it's like F0i, F0i, for instance. So we always get two minus signs and this is invariant with respect to time reverse. Here, this is a, there is a single zero here. So this would flip signs. And in order to compensate for that, you should also flip sign for theta. So time reversal acts simply by uh, sending theta to minus theta. And in terms of the in terms of the complexified coupling constant, this can be summarized as this sort of anti-holomorphic involution where you send tau to minus tau bar. Okay, so now let's reanalyze what is happening in the time reversal invariant setup. So why is theta equals to pi time reversal invariant? Well, let's, let's go through the chain. So we have theta equals to pi in the topological insulator. Then we uh, apply time reversal invariance. It's sent to theta equals to minus pi. But then we use the T generator of, of the SL to Z duality group and we add two pi and we end up with pi again. So that's why basically theta equals to minus pi is the same as theta equals to pi and the full set of the topological insulator state is uh, time reversal invariant. So now in the dynamical theory, why don't we just use the S generator instead? So what does the S generator do? The S generator takes tau, it sends it to minus one over tau. You can also write that as minus tau bar divided by modulus squared of tau. And you will find that it actually acts exactly like the time reversal um, transformation in case that um, the modulus of tau is equal to one. However, remember that the imaginary part of tau gives you the gauge coupling. So modulus of tau being one tells you that you're actually at strong coupling. So at least this is suggestive in a sense that there might be a potential for time reversal invariant phases at strong coupling. And now um, let's, let's just discuss it in terms of physically in, uh, distinguishable coupling constants. So basically tau takes values in the upper half plane. Then you mod out the full SL2C duality. You get the standard fundamental domain here. And now let's see what, what kind of contour inside of this uh, moduli space is time reversal invariant. Well, you'll we find the trivial, trivial phase where theta equals to zero. This is this line here. You will find the uh, topological insulator phase where theta equals to pi, which is this line here. Those two have uh, points at, at infinitely weak coupling, which is then actually the, the topological insulator. But then you also have this arg region here where the uh, absolute value of tau equals to one and which are related by this S generator of the SL to Z duality. Now, if you hear upper half plane modded out by SL2Z, and if, you, if you're an F theorist, then probably all the alarm, alarm bells um, go off and you will, you will immediately try to geometrize the, the problem. Namely, you want to parametrize this physically inequivalent couplings in terms of a complex structure of auxiliary torus, just the, given by this tau. And of course, then you try to describe this elliptic curve, which is, which is given by this complex structure here in terms of a Weierstrass equation. So this Weierstrass equation has, has these parameters f and g here. And uh, there is a nice one-to-one -one map from the fundamental domain that is given here uh, to the, to the um, complex projective space, CP1. And this is given by the J function, or we use a slightly um, uh, a re uh, uh, renormalized uh, J function just by, by a constant factor here. And you will find that in fact the, the full uh, time reversal invariant subdomain of this moduli space maps exactly to values where J is real. So this is, this is already a nice uh, uh, observation here. So now of course I told you what the time reversal invariant phases are. What about interfaces? Building interfaces like in the topological insulator case. For that, of course, we have to vary tau. 
And we do that again with respect to a single uh, a space coordinate in flat space. And since we want to preserve time reversal invariant, we'll only allow tau to vary inside this subspace, which is time reversal invariant. So the full moduli space would be the CP1 here, essentially. Um, and now we just vary tau on this subdomain, which is, which is um, time reversal invariant. So where j is equal is, is real. And because we have the relation of j given by f and g, this can be realized for f and g being real and already leads you, gives you a hint that it might lead to the realm of real elliptic curves, which are elliptic curves that can be defined over the reals rather than the complex numbers. So another thing that you learn in F theory is whenever the discriminant of your elliptic uh, of your elliptic curve vanishes, you would expect some dynamical states, something happening, some light states in the picture. Well, let's analyze this in this setup here. Uh, you have the the case of jau, uh, j of tau going to plus minus infinity. Actually, this is the same on CP one, and in this case, the, the discriminant vanishes. And in fact. If you remember, j going to plus minus infinity is, is the same as tau going to i infinity. So this interface crossing across this, this cusp point here will be exactly the topological insulator phase. So you would expect something to localize there, something electrically charged to localize there. If you do the analysis, then you find another point. If you do the variation along this uh, time reversal invariant domain where the discriminant vanishes, which is at j equals to uh, 1 and this is in tau equals to i, which is its strong coupling. Okay, so this is the dynamical setup and how to construct interfaces. What if you don't have the full SL2C uh, uh, duality, but only a subgroup? In fact, this often appears if there is some, some charged fields in the four-dimensional theory anyway, and uh, in this case, often the, the duality group gets reduced, and we will actually find, a, a, we will discuss an example uh, in a bit. So uh, we will concentrate on, on so-called congruent subgroup, which have these funny names. And in this talk, um, I'll just concentrate on this gamma n, which are basically um, matrices in SL2Z, which are um, the identity matrix mod n. So basically it's one plus n times k. And here, this is just a multiple of k, multiple of k, and one plus multiple of k. And of course, now you have less, um, um, identifications of, of, of the coupling constants, which enlarges your fundamental domain, or, is, or as it is often called in, in this setup of a congruent subgroup, the modular curve. And again, as in the SL2C example, we're not interested in the full moduli space, but we are actually interested in the subset, uh, which uh, is time reversal invariant. So you can write it as follows. So we, we, we call it the modular, the real part of the modular curve or the real subspace, the time reversal invariant subspace of the modular curve. It's basically given by those taus inside the, the modular curve in which you find that minus tau bar equals to tau. Or if you want to formulate it in terms of the upper half plane, and actually we take the compactification, so we include the cusp which basically the cusps, which basically means that we add the point at i infinity, as well as all the, all the uh, irrational uh, numbers on the real line. Then the formulation of this time reversal invariant subspace is given by minus tau bar, can be mapped to tau, it, it is the same as a gamma inside this uh, subgroup of SL2Z acting on tau. Okay. So uh, let's go to a simple example, namely the one for gamma two, which is generated by these uh, three matrices here. And you already see it's not anymore the T matrix, the T generator of SL2Z, but actually this guy would rather correspond to T squared. Before in SL2Z, we found that we have the two phases at uh, theta equals to zero and theta equals to pi and we use t. Now we, have, we don't have t anymore. So one conclusion you should immediately see if you see that this is a generator rather than t is that you have the time reversal invariant subspace is not at theta equals to zero and pi, but theta equals to zero and probably two pi. And in fact, this is exactly what you find. So again, you have theta equals to zero is trivially uh, a time reversal invariant. And then you have theta equals to two pi here being time reversal invariant. And again, there is something that relates weak and strong coupling in this set of gamma two, and this will lead to a contour in the in that strong coupling regime here. 
Now there are three special points. So we find one single component of time reversal invariant values in this uh, real part of the modular curve, and three special points, which are given by the cusps. So one cusp is at I-infinity. There we would expect electric states from uh, just anticipated from, from what we learned in the topological insulator example. Then we have a state at tau equals to zero, which is mapped to um, um, tau equals to I-infinity by the S generator of SL2Z, which you can still act. It's not in the group, but it, it maps uh, physically distinct uh, states here. So you would expect something like localized magnetic states here. And the same thing is true if you, uh, uh, if you find the coset representative that tr transforms I-infinity down to minus one, you would expect something dionically charged here. Now, is there another, is there a similar identification in terms of uh, real values of like a, a function that maps this fundamental domain to CP1? Yes, it's indeed true. So here, instead of the J function, which is the, the help module for SL2Z, you can use the elliptic lambda function. And in general, uh, for genus zero subgroups of SL2Z, you will find a help module that, that should do the job. So it should map the, the, the time reversal invariant domain to like the real values of this help model. Okay, so this is a lot of words and a lot of strong coupling. So we should at least have some example where we can test some of these hypotheses. And one example is cyber witten theory. So this is n equals to two super young mills in four dimensions with gauge algebra given by SU2. And we know that in the IR, it's broken to a U1 gauge theory everywhere in moduli space. And also there, the gauge coupling is defined in terms of a Weierstrass, it's not really Weierstrass model, but in terms of an elliptic curve given by this equation here, which depends on the vacuum expectation value of the uh, adjoint scalar in the vector multiplet, essentially. And this curve here has duality group given by gamma two, the one we, we identified before. So basically now the question is, can we find these states here in the cyber witten example? And indeed we can. So crossing the interface at tau equals to I infinity leads to localized electric uh, states. So this would be the, the corresponding W bosons. And remember the W bosons in this model have charge two. This is also corresponds to the fact that now we jump not by theta equals to uh, zero to pi, but zero to two pi. And um, at the points here, down here, the two cusps in this lower region, we actually find that in moduli space, we'll end up on the monopole point where monopoles become light and the dion point where dion become, dions become light. So uh, you would um, recreate exactly the expectation in this well-controlled setup, even at strong coupling. Now, a similar analysis can be done for other n equals to two theories. And we did that in, in, the, in the paper. Um, uh, for example, for SO8. And there can also be more exotic behaviors. For example, in Argyris Douglas theories, you would expect that there can be certain interface points that you cross and you have simultaneously electric and magnetic states that become light in these setups. Okay, so this was gamma two, but can we do it for general subgroups? And yes, we can because it was done by mathematicians in 2011. They classify the real components of basically all the modular curves of these uh, congruent subgroups that I, I presented before. And the nice thing is in all cases, this uh, uh, time reversal invariant subdomain splits into disconnected sets of topological circles, which contain special points. And these special points can be either elliptic or cusps. And usually those special points indicate the presence of localized states. So let's uh, in, in this paper, they, uh, the, the author actually gives a graphical uh, 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 presentation. So let's, let's just see how it looks like in, in our cases that we studied so far. So in SL2Z, we had the two points where the discriminant vanishes, one at I, this is the elliptic point here, and one at uh, I infinity. So this can be read as something like uh, one divided by zero. So this actually is the point at infinity. And in fact, this is exactly one component that, that we saw before. In gamma two, we saw we had a single component with three cusps. And in fact, we have a single component with three cusps now. Uh, one is at zero, one is at infinity, and one is at one. So this exactly reconstructs here. And in other examples, we, you can have several components. For example, in gamma n, uh, where n is divisible by four, you will have several components where each one has four cusps in this, this following fashion here. 
But note that only one of those components will contain the, the weak coupling point, which is the equivalent of the topological insulator interface. So now, now what can we learn from here? So if you want to build a time reversal invariant configuration, so if you want to vary your, your coupling constants, you have to stick to one component. So that tells you that only a certain array of, of interfaces that just basically going around one of those components are allowed with respect to time reversal invariance. So you can only collect the interfaces that you start from one value and then you go around, for example, this contour or this contour. Um, and moreover, actually we know about the, the excitations and the charges of the excitations and we can even learn something about the mutual statistics of excitation on the interface of these guys with these guys, which might lead to also to, to more interesting dynamical behavior on this, in this setups. Now let's go to the 60 interpretation. So we know that Maxwell theory can be formulated in terms of an anti-symmetric uh, uh, six-dimensional tensor field B on a torus. So basically, the the the, um, the anti self sorry it has to be anti self dual here, which tells you that it doesn't contain two u ones, but actually they're mapped under electric magnetic duality, and then you can identify the the electric gauge field in terms of integrating b over one of the standard one cycles and the magnetic gauge field in terms of of integrating b over the other uh, the other of the one cycles. The charge stays in this setup would be just strings that couple to B and then can wrap around the torus and lead to, uh, to particle states in four dimensions. And in this setup, tau is literally the complex structure of this torus. So it's not any more like an auxiliary torus, it's an actual physical torus of a 60 theory. And now it also becomes clear why uh, the vanishing of the discriminant should lead to mass or localized massless states because we know when the discriminant vanishes actually one of the combination of one cycles a linear combination of the the blue and the red C will will pinch down and this will just lead to massless states if there is a string in the picture um, and we can also read off the, the electric and magnetic charges just by counting the number of times the pinching circle wraps around the two uh, the two generating one cycles uh, on the torus, which is here given by the blue and the red C. Okay, um, we can also reconstruct the setup with a, a not SL2Z, but a congruent subgroup by demanding that some of the line operators are invariant in four dimensions. So how do, you, how do we construct line operators? Well, we start with a surface operator, which is just the exponential of B, and then we wrap it again around the linear combination of the blue and the red uh, one cycle. And this will lead to a combination of a Wilson and a Toft line. And now if we say we want a subset of these guys, for example, say we want R mod 2 and S mod 2 to be uh, uh, invariant under the duality group, and this will lead to a congruent subgroup. So in this case, this will lead to gamma 2 being the, the right duality group. There is also an alternative description. If you think about reducing the B field in terms of like uh, harmonic one forms, then you can find that actually this full setup is classified by torsion points on the dual Jacobian curve. And then if you heard hear torsion points on elliptic curves, so the Jacobian of a, of a, of a torus is again a, a, a torus which means um, the action is also the same on, on the torus and on the, on the uh, Jacobian. And if you have torsion points that should stay invariant, you would immediately find the, the, the congruent subgroups of SL2C because that is partially how they are defined. So they're defined as subgroups of SL2C that leave a certain subset of the torsion points on the torus invariant. And again, for example, gamma two preserves C2 times C2 torsion. The nice thing about this here is while the other approach did not really have a generalization to what happens in higher genus examples, this naturally generalizes to, to the higher genus case. Okay, so this is, this is the setup of how to construct this. So, but why do we stop there? Can we do more? And um, yeah, so what we did so far is uh, we just varied the shape of the torus in a way with some subtleties uh, involving time reversal invariance. So we didn't do a, a, a random variation on moduli space, but only on this real subdomain. But what we could do is why, why do we just stick to the torus? Why don't we, for example, start with a sphere, then 
move along one direction in the four-dimensional non-compact space and the torus turns slow, uh, the, sorry, the sphere turns into a torus and back into a sphere. And for example, if you take a, a single 6D fermion on this setup, you will find that there is no zero mode here, there is no zero mode here, but there is two uh, zero modes in four dimensions of compact. So taking a 6D fermi vial fermion, you will find a 240 valve fermion if you compactify on the torus here. So it should be that there is uh, localized states here. Same thing is you could start with a geometry with a Riemann surface and start varying fluxes, for instance. And in some cases, especially for example, think about a 60 SCFT where we have access to the anomaly polynomial and we can actually plug in a variation of the, of the uh, genus as well as um, the fluxes you have some control just by the anomaly polynomial because it will tell you that the chiral degrees of freedom are more inside or outside of this, of this interface. So this generates in, in a way a, a sort of thick interface where you are guaranteed to have a mismatch of either chiral degrees of freedom or just degrees of freedom in general between the outside and the inside region. So these are again localized states. And now, of course, it's, it, it would be nice to use the same um, um, logic with using time reversal invariance in the interplay with real geometry to just collapse this interface to zero thickness, but still preserving these localized states as before. But this is just an advertisement for you to have a look at the paper and, and see how it's, it's, it's done a bit, a bit more um, in detail. Okay, with that, I actually come to my conclusions. So um, what we did is we used duality together with time reversal invariance in order to find uh, uh, this, uh, sorry, we used duality in order to find the time reversal invariant regions in the full moduli space, which uncovers a nice connection between this real geometry uh, and in, in, in case of Maxwell theory, this um, real subspace of the elliptic curve. And we deduced the localized degrees of freedom um, in terms of this, uh, again, in, in terms of this duality constraints. And these are associated to special points on the, on the real subdomain, um, for example, cusps. So this is the general example where you're guaranteed that delta vanishes for, for the elliptic points. It's not guaranteed, but it happens in, in some cases, as I pointed out before. And this uh, is not just em an empty statement, but it actually passes nice test in, in where we have control of a strong coupling regime, namely the n equals to two supersymmetric theories. It also has the interpretation in terms of higher dimensional theories, which might be very interesting in terms of compactification of 60 SCFTs, for instance. And uh, I just give you, gave you a hint of how one might use other more exotic possibilities to geometrically engineer these kind of interfaces. And with that, uh, let me come to my outlook. So what I didn't tell you so far is that there is, can actually be anomalies in these duality groups. And in fact, there is a reason why we, why we have to stick to the, to the real line and uh, uh, flat geometry, because in fact, if you consider Maxwell theory on a, on a curved manifold, you will find uh, that there is a mixed gravitational SL2Z anomaly. So what happens to these interfaces in these setups would be a nice interesting problem. And of course I told you that um, we started with a cyborg witten with SU2. There is a global real realization of that that has a one form, global one form symmetry which is given by the center and how can we generalize this to other non-abelian groups. And then, of course, if you're F-theorist, then again, I told you something about torsion group, uh, torsion points, and I told you something about congruent subgroups, and this points immediately in the direction of, of modal vial torsion in, in F-theory context. I also told you that uh, the time reversal invariance actually acts as an um, anti-holomorphic involution, which is something you use in order to construct uh, spin-7 manifolds. And in fact, a similar process of this fibering over a real line was recently done also at Penn, um, where you take a G2 manifold and you, you, you fiber it over a real line, and in fact, then you, you end up with a spin seven manifold. So maybe we can nicely combine these two setups and even make a connection to something like time reversal invariance. And since, since we, we uh, use concepts of time reversal invariance and sort of topological uh, setups here, it might be that we can go beyond SUSY. So the topological insulator where nothing is dynamical, actually you can go beyond SUSY and this is done, but can we do that in this more general setup? And uh, 
we believe that it should be more stable, it's all, even without SUSE. But of course, this it has you have to find nice setups in order to test this uh, hypothesis. And that's it. Thank you very much. All right, Marcus, thank you for the very nice talk. It looks like uh, Miguel has a question. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. That was very nice. Actually, my question was basically about the first point of your outlook, so you already kind of addressed it. But yeah. I'm, ju I'm just wondering if you expect that this more general um, time reversal in, uh, actions, could they have different anomalies to the one forms, the central one forms, the, the, the ones that we have? So, or, or, so, because it also seems like you can connect them continuously, right? So that would hint at a no, but. So I'm, I'm not sure. One, one hint where you can find what might be happening is uh, actually non-abelian theories, where we know that there should be something like a, a mixed anomaly between time reversal invariance and the higher form, one form center symmetry. So sometimes you actually find uh, mixed anomalies in the two setup so now the question is in this very simple set of generalized maxwell theories which just have uh, uh, this can you find the same thing but one 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 thing for instance so if you use s duality if you if you look in the paper by witten in 95 uh, testing sl2z invariance of uh, a billion just a billion uh, maxwell theory then you will find you can use t and the partition function stays invariant if you use S instead, you will get a phase in the partition function, which depends on the signature of the manifold, right? So if you have flat space, of course, this is fine because it just vanishes and you're, you're done. S and T are good transformations. But let's say you're on a K3, for instance, it's not right. anymore true and it shifts by a phase. So, so you're saying that your time reversal has a mixed rotation anomaly with some different morphisms in K3? Yeah, that's what I would say. And so do you think that you could use, you, you could in principle could use this kind of reasoning to put stuff in the swamp land, right? I mean... Well, there is no, there is no gravity, so uh, I right, would say but no. no but if if things like this arise coupled to gravity. That's right. So if, if you interpret the background as uh, some gravitational background and you find indeed some, some mixed anomaly there, yeah, maybe. Yeah. But I, I mean, nobody tells you that your theory that you're looking for is time reversal invariant, right? So, it, so w if you demand time reversal invariance, and this is a problem. But if you say like, oh, I don't care if my, my, my uh, theory actually spontaneously break, breaks time reversal invariance, and we know in, in real life you have CP violation. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it a, as a swampland constraint because time reversal is not a good, good quantum uh, state, so to say. Okay, thanks. All right, it looks like Paul has a question. Hi, Marcus. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Nice talk. Um, yeah, I was just wondering. So, um, so in, in in which in which regard is it important to to which congruent subgroup you are you are restricting yourself? I mean, you can. I mean, there's there's also way more crazy stuff than gamma naught and the gamma That's right. uh, gamma n. So, uh, if you just play around with all these things, uh, what would you expect to to find? Or can you? So, um, in a sense, these um, these congruence subgroups are very natural in a way. If you can uh, phrase it in terms of these charges, so let me go to the corresponding slide. Probably it's, it's not even so. Yeah. Um, so, for example, um, if you go to the gamma n space, then you can uh, to the gamma n congruence subgroup. Then you can say something, you have dynamical particles um, that have charge N, electric and charge N magnetic, and you have dynamical particles for all of these, you, you know, uh, a bigger lattice inside the full electric magnetic charge lattice. Then you know that in your theory, you break your one form global symmetry down to a Zn times Cn, mm -hmm. right? Electric and magnetic. And then you can demand how your duality group acts on this set of line operators defined by this Cn times Cn. And, and if you do that, you can have the natural interpretation. And then, in fact, gamma n will preserve the full, like, Zn times Cn set of line operators in there. Gamma 1 will preserve either electric or magnetic or one line of dionic, right? And the gamma 0 is a bit, is a bit weird because it will preserve one line, but not each element-wise, uh, element but it will allow mixing among those guys. 
So in a way, these naturally appear. And I agree that there, maybe you can come up with some more interesting setups. But in fact, also the, 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 the math literature on you know, the real components, of course, focuses on these congruent subgroups because they behave nice. That's right. But you, but you also uh, would, con you would constrain yourself always to those groups that have uh, a genus zero modular curve. So for genus zero, you find this nice uh, um, mapping to CP1, and it seems that you can always find that the time reversal will be the RP1 inside the CP1, which is nice, right? So you really have the real values. You basically have a circle on a sphere, and this will be your time reversal invariance values, uh, which of course cannot be the general picture because you know that in, in other cases like gamma n for large n, this will split into different components, so it cannot stay a single one. Um, but Maybe for the gamma zero, for the, for the genus uh, zero cases it is. But this framework would work, I would guess, also for higher genus cases and might actually lead to way more interesting stuff there because then you have the different components. Exactly. You can do cool. weird stuff, you know, you can actually say this interface you can never have in the same theory with this interface because otherwise you would break time reversal invariance. Mm -hmm. like There's something like a large end limit. <laughs> Maybe. I see. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan or, or Ethan, do you want to uh, expand on your comments at all? Oh, yeah. So we, we did actually talk uh, in the paper about higher n, which leads to a modular curve of higher genus. Right. Um, so we did indeed uh, comment on the fact that you could have these uh, components of the uh, real components of the modular curve, which are completely disconnected from uh, weak coupling. Mm -hmm. to uh, in intrinsically strongly coupled uh, interfaces. Uh, so, so, so we did discuss that in the paper. Good, thanks. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, uh, thanks to both of our speakers for the excellent talks today. And uh, next week we'll have Gianluco Zagrado and Eduardo Gonzalo uh, speaking. So hope to see you all there. Thanks. <laughs>